So taking a look at storage on UCS, we have two main different fabric interconnect modes for storage. The first is the end host mode, and this is running uh, end port virtualization. This is the default and it's recommended. And basically what we have is we have FCOE or fiber channel over ethernet uh, performed from the server blades through the chassis, through the IO modules up to the fabric interconnects. And then at that point it's decapsulated and the floggies of course are turned into F discoveries and uh, transmitted to the upstream fiber channel switch uh, F port running in NPIV mode. Now there is no FCOE support northbound from the FIs in 2.0 like in the lab, but in 2.1 uh, which was just recently released, the Del Mar code name, that actually is now supported. So what you'll most likely see in the lab will not have northbound FCOE. That doesn't mean that you won't have any configuration related to FCOE in your Nexus 5K switches in the actual CCIE lab. We will take a look at where that will happen and that will most likely be with something called adapter effects from your C-series server. And that's uh, really one of the last things, well, second to last thing before administration that we'll take a look at. So then there's also the fiber channel switching mode and you can change the fabric interconnect over to switching mode and of course this will require a reboot. This has limited use. There's no zoning configuration direct uh, that you can do in the actual UCS manager in version 2.0. Instead, it gets its zoning from an upstream switch through CFS or Cisco Fabric Services. Now in 2.1, direct zoning configuration is supported. So this is part of the reason why for the 2.0 where it has to get its zoning configuration from an upstream switch, uh, why it must be a Cisco MDS or a Cisco Nexus uh, 5000 fiber channel switch. So fiber channel switching in 2.0 is necessary for storage array direct connection to the fabric interconnects. And it's designed for very small scale or demo type, you know, pod type environments. So let's also take a look at HBAs, host bus adapters and port worldwide names. We present two normal host bus adapters to the OS using standard PCIe virtualization. Standard OS level multipathing software is required. So for example, PowerPath or DMP or MPIO, whatever you're already using based on your storage uh, vendors. There is no hardware failover. So this follows standard fiber channel practices. For worldwide names, port worldwide names, uh, Emulex and Lo QLogic converged network adapters have burned in addresses. The M81KR Palo card or the VIC-1240, the VIC-1280, they do not. So there's really three methods for port worldwide name usage. You can get derived from the burned in address, which obviously if you configure that, you would have an error if your card underneath was a Palo card. If it was an Emulex or QLogic, this would be perfectly fine. You can manually assign this, not recommended, but it is an option. I've seen remote use cases where this is uh, necessary. Maybe I spun up a lab environment and I don't want to have to redo my zoning, but I had erased my UCS manager. In the past, I have manually assigned the same port worldwide name back because of course, if I do it from a pool in 2.0, there's no guarantee of what address will be assigned. In 2.1 for UCS manager, we can do a linear, uh, a linear assignment of addresses from pools. And then of course, from the pool, as we just mentioned. So taking a look at vSAN's trunking and port channels, we can have an ISL, inner switch link, with multiple vSANs heading northbound out of the fabric interconnects to the fiber channel fabric. In 2.0, we cannot limit which vSANs head northbound out of the fabric interconnects. They all do. What we can do is we can limit which vSANs are allowed to traverse uh, into the switch from the perspective of the actual 5K, you know, Nexus 5K or Cisco MDS switch. So from that side of things, uh, we do have the ability to limit that. 
There is a limit of 32 vSANs per UCS system in 2.0. And port channels can or really should be used uh, whenever possible with trunking. You can use up to 16 fiber channel interfaces in a port channel. And the hash hashing algorithm is the standard OXID, same as the Nexus 5K, and it's actually not configurable in 2.0. And of course, using port channels with your upstream switches, this can be done in end host mode, not just FC switching. Uh, it's really supported in both, um, but this is only supported with Cisco MDS or N5K, uh, Nexus 5000s in F port channel mode. In fact, if you're not using port channeling, uh, the VHBA would need to refloggy. So it's really a good idea to do this uh, and, and in order to make this work on an MDS, you do have to enable the feature F port channel trunk. Taking a look at direct connect fiber channel or FCOE storage, you have to be in FC switching mode. And again, this is for 2.0. Uh, remember that fiber channel and ethernet modes are independent. So I can have in, let's say 2.0 release, I could have uh, fiber channel in switching mode, but I could have uh, my LAN connectivity, my Ethernet, and end host mode. So I can be running NIV, Ethernet, end host mode, and full FC switching. They're mutually exclusive. Remember, I still must have a upstream fiber channel or FCOE switch to configure zoning in 2.0. That's the reason it has to be a 5K or MDS. So then why use it? Well, and again, this is something that's changed in 2.1. Uh, but in 2.0, there was still use cases. So maybe you have a new FCOE storage array, uh, but the upstream, you know, you only had like a MDS 9148 with no FCOE storage. You've got a director class switch. Um, you could use the zoning there on the 9148, but then attach the FCOE storage directly to the FIs. Again, this has all been solved in 2.1, uh, but just thought I would mention how to do it and why you might do it and in the older 2.0 release, because that is what's on the lab. And then switching will be local on the fabric interconnects. And of course, if it's in FC switching mode, they do get an FC domain or, or they consume one of the uh, limited FC domain IDs. If they're in end host mode or NPV mode, you already know from standard fiber channel NPV that that does not consume an FC domain ID. So first of all, on the SAN tab, notice that we have a lot of the similar uh, construct that we saw on the LAN tab with relation to fiber channel port channels and uplink interfaces. Now we've mentioned that we've already disabled interface 13 through 32. So why are they still showing up as fiber channel uplink? Well, there really aren't, if you remember, and I can go back to SAN cloud and click on SAN, uh, right over here I can click on SAN Uplinks Manager just like I did click on LAN Cloud on the LAN tab in LAN Uplinks Manager. And there really are no unconfigured fiber channel ports. So we have two ports with SFPs present, uh, two for Fabric A and two for Fabric B, ports 11, and if I just uh, make this a little bigger, ports 111 and 112. And then the other ports are disabled so as not to go against my licensing count, but there's really storage FC ports or there are um, fiber channel over ethernet, but that's back in the ethernet side, of course, not in fiber channel native side. Uh, so there's basically ethernet, uh, sorry, FC uplinks and FC storage ports. And again, if I want storage ports, I need to set the fiber channel to switching mode. Currently, it's in end host mode or NPV. So I do already have my, let's just switch over to my console. Actually, let's switch over to my diagram first. And uh, previously, I had shown the N5Ks connected. I actually, re, uh, I actually fixed that on my topology. Let me pull up the new topology. 
and actually I don't have it uh, I don't have it posted here yet but um, I'll I'll spit that PNG back out but I actually do have a port channel set up on the MDS side for the two links that are coming down to Fabric Interconnect A and Fabric Interconnect B. So from my MDS1, we're going to look at FC1 7 through 8 and FC1 7 through 8 on MDS2 as well. So we'll switch over to the console or telnet into MDS1 and 2. And let's do show run interface FC1 7 through 8. And I'll see that I have uh, channel group 2 force turned on. Of course, rate mode dedicated for that channel group. And uh, show run pipe 2 include feature. I've got feature NPIV and feature F port channel trunk running on my MDS. So over here. Uh, show run pipe to include feature as well as show run interface FC one slash seven through eight. Okay, this is actually a uh, uh, this switch is a ninety two sixteen I, whereas my MDS one is a 9222i so it's a much more capable switch but we are running both in native fiber channel mode so for ports fc 111 and 12 on fia or fi1 and my fabric interconnect b same ports fi uh, sorry fiber channel 111 and 12 we'll go ahead and go back to the configuration web interface and we're going to create a port channel out of those. So I'll name this, which fabric interconnect, I'm on FI, fabric A, there we go. Just wanted to make sure, because I'll name them differently. So we'll create port channel uh, one. Let's say 11 and 12. Oops, that is not what the button I meant to hit. And we'll say finish. Oh, and the port channel ID one is already allocated to a LAN port channel. So there's no check for overlap coverage, but it does have that error prevention. So that's quite useful. So I could create port channel two because that only exists in fabric B, but I'm not gonna do that. So I'll just create uh, one one. Okay, and then I'll also go on fabric B and say create port channel and I'll say, uh, let's say one, two, and this is port channel two. And I'm going to go ahead and enable this port channel. Actually, let's go back over to the command line of the MDS. And let's do show port channel summary. And I can see that I have uh, port channel, uh, actually I had called it port channel two from this side. Port channel one was actually going over to my uh, N5Ks, N5K1. But regardless of the numbering, it's locally significant. So port channel 2. I'll go ahead and go back and enable that port channel for fabric interconnect A and also enable the port channel for fabric B. And I could come and I could create a pin group if I like as well. Now I only have um, I only have one set of really interfaces that are active and they're both a member of the port channel so it really doesn't make sense to. I'm not going to go ahead and do that but I certainly could. Um, I suppose I can, it just means that I would need to 
uh, go populate that in my VHBAs. So since I only have one active port channel, I'll just leave it there. And actually, let's go ahead and take a look. Let me go back into that SAN Uplinks Manager. And up here at the top, we had uh, things like Fiber Channel Identity Assignment. If we were running in switching mode, um, worldwide pools, vSAN. So we're basically seeing a lot of what we are able to see here in the, the main view over to the left, the main uh, navigation pane. So we can, right from here, create our SAN pin groups. Uh, notice from Fabric A, we have vSANs. We have those from Fabric B as well. And then we have the default and also just global vSAN. So if we go to create vSAN, we can do the same things that we were able to do in Ethernet mode. We can create a global vSAN ID and then link that to a particular FCOE ID or FCOE VLAN. Um, we can configure one for only Fabric A, one for only Fabric B, or both fabrics have separate vSAN and FCOE. Now remember this FCOE is only going to be locally significant between the chassis and the FIs when we're running an in-house mode. We're just going to use vSAN 1 for everything. We also have a number of threshold policies related to storage, uh, just like we would ex expect to have and did have in Ethernet. So fiber channel, sorry, there's, there's the threshold policies here. Um, and we also have uh, a number of We'll talk about the policies. We might as well go ahead and talk about those now since there are a limited number of policies for Fiber Channel. We basically have these policies for the operating system that deal with the transmit and receive queue size, uh, the SCSI I.O. queues, and floggy retries, uh, port login retries, error detection, and they are, I want to say, really just about the same values for the various OS's. Uh, let's see, one of the differences being the port downtime between, let's say, Linux and VMware. Uh, Windows is going to be uh, slightly different. Actually, there's not much different here by default, but we do have the ability to set these to different defaults if we want. Max LUNs per target, IO throttle count, those are all just about the same. So we do have the ability to create different adapter policies based on the OS that will be using the VHBA. And we'll see these as assignable policies when we go create our VHBAs in our service profiles. We do have down here uh, worldwide name, uh, worldwide node name pools, worldwide port name pools, uh, we've got the default pool with its current size is zero. We have no actual addresses in there, as well as iSCSI, uh, IQN pools. We're going to take a look at those. We'll also take a look at under the LAN tab, under the, if I scroll down, there we go, under pools for MAC address pools, and then also um, under admin for UUID and uh, management IP address pools. But we're going to take a look at those after we've talked about some specifics related to addressing MAC address and uh, worldwide name addressing and some of the recommended practices that Cisco TAC has come out with after, you know, two plus years, three plus years of installs, problems and, and things of that nature. Okay, one of the things that I hadn't shown before the break was the Floggy database. So let's just do a show Floggy database. Actually, let's do a show port channel summary. 
and we see that port channel 2, uh, show run interface, port channel 2 is actually what we're using. Uh, I switched this over to mode F. I just forced it rather than letting it stay auto. Uh, it has two ports. The first port is FC17, show run interface FC17 through 8 are using channel group 2. And if we do show floggy database uh, and pipe to include uh, port channel, we can see that port channel 2 has uh, the the FI, this is actually the port and node worldwide name for the Fabric Interconnect itself for the port channel has gone ahead and floggied with the Fabric. So let's also, um, let's go ahead and we're just going to take port channel 2. Let's disable this port channel on, uh, or 1, 2, on Fabric B and let's show how this might uh, be differentiated from a port channel on Fabric A. So let's actually delete this port channel altogether. And those ports will go back as uplink ports, 11 and 12. And we're going to go ahead and enable each of these interfaces for 11 and 12. You can just right click and do it as well but interfaces 13 and beyond will still be disabled. So we should be able to uh, go over to our MDS2 and and I've actually already gone ahead and removed the channel group uh, during the break for port 7 and 8. So if I do a show floggy database I should see, whoops, pass them, uh, FC 1, 7, and 8 flogging with the fabric. Okay, so we have the port and node worldwide name for the particular uh, fabric interconnect. So let's go take a look at, uh, back at the fabric interconnect. And let's go over to equipment, and I'm not sure why that appears to be kind of cut off over there. Oh, it's because of my scroll bar here. There we go. And let's go take a look at our fabric interconnects. And if I find the right, there we go, uplink FC ports. I should see the worldwide port name for 11 and 12. And they're all the same worldwide port name. Our, actually I'm on Fabric Interconnect A, so they're not going to be what we see on MDS2. This should be a little bit better. There we go. Uh, Charlie 5, 6 Alpha, 8, 0. Charlie 5, 6 Alpha, 8, 0 for the PWWN. So these are properly floggied, and we can go ahead and move on, assuming that we create VHBAs, and uh, those should properly, or I should say, when we create VHBAs, we can uh, certainly assume or believe, hope, and verify, um, or trust and verify, uh, as the old saying goes, that those floggy to the MDS as well.